Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point. I'm Li Chou Yuan, sitting in for Liu Xi. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to our guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. This week, our COVID-19 coverage continues. The situation is changing dramatically by the day as the number of confirmed cases continues to swell around the world. And according to the WHO, as of March 19th, the total number of confirmed cases has reached 209,839, with the epicenter of the pandemic shifting from China to Europe. After Italy, one of the hardest hit countries, announced a lockdown. More countries, including Spain and France, followed suit. Others have initiated travel restrictions, border shutdowns, and social distancing measures aimed at slowing the spread of the pandemic. All the newly confirmed cases in China over the past week come from two big sources: one from Hubei and the other from abroad. In other words, there have been zero new domestic cases reported outside of Hubei province over the past week, according to China's National Health Commission. And to address this worrisome trend of growing imported cases, China has shifted some of its strategies. Local officials have started to roll out new policies depending on the specific situation of each province or city. As a major hub for international travelers, Beijing has also introduced new measures over the past few days. The latest announcement from Beijing municipal government says that starting from March 16th, anyone entering Beijing from outside the country will be transferred to a designated facility from a mandatory 14-day quarantine. Well, costs will be borne by the travelers themselves. And considering all the efforts people in China have been making to prevent the spread, not to mention the toll on the economy and people's mental health, China isn't taking any chances. Nobody in China wants to see the numbers spike again. It's an important story to share, but please share the story responsibly. Unfortunately, some media aren't doing so. So now let's take our first、uh, example. The Wall Street Journal published its piece: China's coronavirus war targets a new threat: foreigners. On March the 12th, first of all, the language chosen for the headline. War targets threat. It's all very aggressive and alarming. But why not focus on information rather than emotion? Infuse it with facts instead of fear. Like its headline on U.S. President Trump's EU travel ban, they read, "U.S. to ban travel from Europe for 30 days due to coronavirus." Well, it has quite a different ring than U.S. coronavirus war targets new threat: Europeans. Right? But more importantly, the headline leaves out a key piece of information: China's new regulations apply not just to foreigners, but also to any Chinese nationals who are returning from abroad. It's misleading. The article says epidemic control efforts have turned to foreigners in China in recent days, as confirmed cases within the country have slowed, and that on the ground foreigners have sometimes been singled out. Accounts from one American and one Bulgarian who had to answer some extra questions about themselves and their travel histories appear in the article, but there's no mention of what kinds of questions and restrictions Chinese nationals who are returning from abroad must undergo as well. So how do we know foreigners have been quote unquote singled out? A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson cleared up any concerns over favoritism when, on March the 16th, that since importation of cases from overseas has become a major risk for many localities in China, authorities have taken some inspections, quarantine, prevention, and control measures on international arrivals in accordance with the law and regulations. He added, these measures are for the safety and health of both Chinese and foreign nationals. And apply equally to Chinese and foreign citizens. The article and readers would benefit from more accuracy and balance. Now, our next piece brings up the same issue, but its headline is doused with vitriol. So take a look at this. China scoffed at being subject to early coronavirus travel restrictions. Now it's enacting its own, says the Fortune magazine piece published on March the fourth. Well. Scuffed is one way to put it, but being logical is what most people would call it. 
And here's why. The article says when the coronavirus first cropped up in earnest in January, countries around the world, from the United States to Australia to Russia, scrambled to close their borders to travelers from China. Beijing criticized such moves at the time. Some countries, the U.S. in particular, have inappropriately overreacted. A spokesperson for China's foreign ministry said of the travel restrictions in early February, but now the tables have turned. As China sees its coronavirus caseload decline, officials are taking steps to reduce the risk of travelers to China reintroducing the virus. So, first of all, China has not closed its borders to travelers coming from anywhere, including hotspots like the United States and Europe. Stepping up regulations is quite a different thing than instituting a blanket travel ban, because second of all, travel bans don't work. Early on, the WHO and epidemiologists advised against blanket travel bans. Italy imposed a ban on flights from China on January the 31st, the first EU country to do so. And yet, the country quickly became the new epicenter, with the highest number of cases outside China. The U.S. began temporarily denying entry to foreign nationals who had been in China for 14 days prior to their arrival to the U.S. in early February. And only now are we beginning to see how bad the situation really is in the states, given effective measures weren't taken earlier. Now, the wiser move would be to ramp up testing and screenings based on the experience of Singapore and other countries and regions that have successfully stopped the massive spread of the virus thus far. And finally, this tables have turned thinking is one of the major tragedies of the entire pandemic. As we have emphasized so many times, this isn't a you versus me situation. We're all in this together. So stop trying to make it about winners and losers. So the question is, can media separate politics from the pandemic? Maybe it's inevitable, but our final example shows that it's certainly possible to do a more professional job. Al Jazeera published the piece, China worries about new coronavirus surge from infected arrivals on March the 4th. The article says, as global coronavirus cases spike, China's demon strategy for foreign visitors, returning citizens. Well, it lays out the news in a neutral and informational way. China is worried, yes, and here's why. A surge from infected arrivals. And here's who's affected, foreign visitors and returning citizens alike. It's void of any glaring agenda or ulterior motives. How refreshing. And the rest of the article talks about the same themes as the other two, but in a more balanced way. It also includes China's side of the story at the end when it says, well, some countries have blocked entry to Chinese and stopped flights, and some of its own local governments appear to be doing the same. Beijing insists it will not seal itself out from the world. It even quotes Chinese spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Zhao Lijian, from a news conference on March the 2nd, when he said, in the current international environment, there is no way we will practice prevention and control by closing up China. Only through global collaboration can we succeed in defeating the virus. If you look, you'll always find another side to the same story, the missing pieces of the puzzle. So now we'll take a short break, and when we come back, I'll ask my guests what's driving media's coverage of China's COVID-19 stories. And from lockdowns to Trump's so-called China virus to developing China-U.S. media war, how is COVID-19 reshaping the geopolitical landscape? Stick around. <laughs> Welcome back to Headline Buster. We're looking at how media report on China's battle against COVID-19. Are the headlines fair, biased, or a bit of both? And as the virus spreads, what is the impact on the bigger geopolitical landscape? Well, I'm now joined by Mario Cavallo, CEO of MT Communications Group from Shenyang in northeastern China, and Professor Ho Wenping, Senior Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. Great to have you both with us. So, things are moving really fast now with new regulations being announced both here in China and around the world by the day, it seems. 
Now, let's take a look at today's topic first. China's new measures to fight imported cases of the virus, given the epicenter has now shifted out of China to Europe, and new cases are mounting in countries around the world. Let me start with Ms. He first, lady first. What are your thoughts on the new measures and how the media have been reporting on these kind of updates? Well, as you rightly put forward, now the table seems uh, turned around. Uh, that is now for China, uh, we have to uh, have, uh, you know, focus on uh, how to preventing those virus uh, imported from overseas now to the China, uh, to, to the mainland China. So actually, because I'm based in Beijing, uh, I can see even my uh, community now has raised this kind of concern. Uh, from uh, those uh, preventing. And we also know uh, every day uh, around like 10 cases, those new cases are all coming from those imported ones. So I think uh, given the concern for this public uh, health security, uh, it is uh, necessary uh, to issue uh, some measures such as uh, those uh, travelers uh, come from uh, the overseas, especially from those uh, hot spots like uh, Italy, like Iran and Spanish, uh, so because the cases are more there. And so uh, you, you have to spend at least 14 days for quarantine. Uh, this is necessary, not only for the people in, in China, and also it's good for themselves and for their family members. So to make uh, uh, things clear, and then after those quarantine stays, and then you join your family. So I think it's uh, uh, nothing saying this is only goes to foreigner. It goes it's going to those Chinese overseas person as well. So this is uh, just for one purpose. That is to contain uh, this virus. We don't want to see any form of discrimination um, happen. But Mario, do you think that the media coverage, the press coverage, has a role to play in this? They are blowing things out of proportion now, or is it because a sense of misinformation that's surrounding in the air? Media coverage in the West, some specific media coverage, not all, is the problem. And there was a specific escalation that I noticed a, a, a rapid and deep increase in the momentum and the intensity of the demonization of China and let me say it this way because it's being echoed throughout Western media that's in support of China people like myself the Atlantic magazine uh, and many others who are pointing it out the obvious the Trump administration delayed and made mistakes that are now costing America a fortune they delayed by weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks the WHO in China and China had informed them weeks and weeks and weeks ago how serious all of this was and they messed it up and now they got problems and what are they going to do? They're going to just trot out the worn terrible strategy of blaming China. It's all over the Western media. So now naturally Chinese people, local Chinese people, are getting kind of mad at all the foreigners blaming China and then a little bit of that emotionally transfers over when they see local China, lo or local foreigner like myself. It's understandable. It's all bad. Nobody wins in this scenario. Very unfortunate. Yeah, and we are in this together. It's sad to see people are turning against each other's group. And now yeah. that the epicenter has shifted, right, and the number of new cases outside China far surpassed those within China, one of our articles we mentioned said the tables turned on China. Uh, Ms. Ho, do you see it that way? What should that mean for China's battle against the virus now? Oh yes, uh, this is a very uh, dangerous situation right now with this virus spreading the uh, whole of the world. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, at this uh, critical moment, uh, not only China and other countries like China suffered before, and uh, now many others are suffering right now. So we, the thing we need to do is unite it together, uh, put down all those suspicious uh, theory saying where the virus come from, uh, which country is behind. So this is very ridiculous, uh, those saying. Uh, I think uh, also, uh, I fully agree with my American colleagues, that is like uh, Trump's administration right now, even President Trump himself, several times he picked up those words saying there's a Chinese virus. Uh, even we got to know those photos released by uh, American, uh, you know, journalists uh, saying uh, even those speech, uh, those uh, uh, script uh, before is written in the, you know, this uh, coronavirus, and then he even moved that 
change replaced as a Chinese virus. So this is not, a, uh, of course, not a rational thing and also unacceptable. Uh, so by, uh, by the time now, I think the Chinese government has done the right thing. That is, uh, we also help other countries like Iran and Italy, and we send our those medical equipment, uh, even those uh, China's experience. Yeah, we have been fighting for virus for such a long time, and we have accumulated uh, those experiences. Uh, those uh, experiences even have been translated uh, into different languages, I heard, like in, uh, in English, like in French. Uh, those uh, uh, experiences can be also shared uh, with other countries. They can. They are not like uh, repeat the mi same mistake we had made at the very earlier stage. So, but unfortunately, some countries, like uh, my colleague just mentioned, yeah, they got the time. Like all the February, uh, China has been using our own efforts uh, to uh, preventing the virus, and then all those one month time, and some countries, some leaders, they turned the deaf ear uh, to what has been suggested and even uh, not hearing those suggestions coming from their own medical experts. So just uh, let those uh, very value, valuable times has been gone away without any preparation. So now uh, we have to face these consequences. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, I think uh, the, all the world, we are living in a global village now. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot all the time, like from January to the December, all those flights have been you know, just uh, suspended. And all those international like events, uh, even the workshops, uh, for example, now even our program uh, have to do the why you don't know why Skype. So this is not the normal way. So global village is a global village. So we need to join the hands together to fight this virus with our joint efforts, mm -hmm. rather than to mutually criticize each other and using those uh, suspicious theory, uh, trying to uh, you know get people's some kind of uh, this different understanding to each other. Yeah, media has a very important role to play in this, and we have to do our job responsibly. Um, now let's take a look at some of the comments from our viewers. So one of the comments said, as a foreigner, I think everyone in China has sacrificed to beat this virus. If foreigners have to undergo a two-week quarantine to keep China safe, then I think that that is a small price to pay. And China has to protect all of us here who have been sacrificing to, for two months months so far. Mario, what's your experience here in China? Have you undergoing uh, have you been undergoing quarantine? You know, I'm really I'm really emotionally attached to this because my wife is from Dongbei and we have you know we take care of her mother, my Yuemu, my mother-in-law mm -hmm. and our beautiful 9-year-old boy. And so we're we're a mixed family and We've been in quarantine for weeks and weeks and weeks, along with 1.4 billion other Chinese people who've done it for the right reasons. You know, I just wrote, I want to mention something. It's even a bit of a breaking news item. Um, you know, I just wrote another article, and the focus of that article was what? Exactly what uh, was just mentioned. The idea that we're a global village. The idea that, and more specifically, I wrote the article about what? civic duty and sacrifice. And when you go home for five weeks and your, your, your child who's watching online classes for five weeks, and believe me, they're not as good as the real thing, right? You know, all of this is a sacrifice. And in the meanwhile, what's happening in America, a, a very, very important friend of mine told me this morning, he sent me the paper. There's people in Florida, who, lawyers, who filed a class action lawsuit in the state of Florida against the country of China for damages for the, quote, causing this global pandemic. And, and we have President Trump calling it the Chinese virus. See all of this happening in the West, in the middle of dead bodies piling up, if I may say it that way, because that's what's happening in Italy, that's what's happening in Iran. It's disgraceful when what we need is the place where we all meet in the middle, civic duty. And there isn't a person on earth who can't get past politics. I don't care if it's from the left or from the right. You meet in the middle in this neutral place called civic duty. And that's what quarantine is part of that. So let's talk about the impact on the bigger geopolitical picture since you mentioned uh, 
what's happening in the states. So let's talk about this, specifically on China-U.S. relations. U.S. President Donald Trump has started calling COVID-19 the China virus. Um, I think we have that quote we can show you. Um, the United States will be powerfully supporting those industries like airlines and others, I'm quoting his words, um, that are particularly affected by the Chinese virus. We will be stronger than ever before. That is according to President Donald Trump. I mean, he has claimed his using the term because China tried to blame the virus on U.S. soldiers. But former First Lady Hillary Clinton criticized his term in a recent tweet. Let me pull that quote out. The president is turning to racist rhetoric to distract from his failures, to take into coronavirus seriously early on, make tests widely available, and adequately prepare the country for a period of crisis. Don't fall for it. Don't let your friends and family fall for it. I mean, this isn't surprising coming from Trump. Nothing new for us here living in China. But what's the impact on his reputation there in the States? Will he mobilize his base by redirecting America's fear and anger toward China? Or will his ploy backfire, Mario? What do you think? Uh, it's, it's amazing. I was just asked exactly that question. What do, do I think it's going to work? And my answer is it's either going to unfortunately work brilliantly or backfire horribly. And I want to point out, Cho Yen, that this is not just President Trump. Uh, uh, let me mention, David Frum, excellent article uh, by David Frum in The Atlantic, just published, pointed out this exact venomous strategy on the right. I'm a conservative, more right side type person, and I'm finding myself now needing to divorce myself from them. Because, for example, people like Ann Coulter, who's a very strong head pundit of the right wing, Fox News, uh, Tucker Carlson, Janine Pirro, these are people that I normally like to listen to. At, they all flipped together with President Trump now on a venomous attack to blame China, recommend de, uh, coupling with China, disengaging with China, going back as far as that foolish guy, Gordon, the anti-China hardline guy, Gordon Chang. They've all ganged up together in, at, at the flip, the flip of a switch. That's what's happened. So it's not just President Trump. So there was a concerted, coordinated decision to escalate this. I don't think that Zhao Lijian tweeting out what he did about you know, saying the virus may have come from somewhere else, it might have come from the army, American army. I don't think Zhao Lijian, by tweeting, I'm going to say, you know, a little bit too much, he kind of like did the same thing that Trump does. It was a little bit too, uh, too forward thing for him to do. I, I kind of wish he hadn't done it, even though his questions are legitimate as to saying, what's really going on here? And now we see, I'm going to say it this way, the right wing showing their true colors. And I'm very upset and I'm very, very disappointed by this. And why is it all being done? Pandering to his base as a re-election campaign. That's how I see it. This is not leadership. Ms. Hill, what do you make of what's just been said? Uh, well, I really buy his idea. I think uh, that's totally true. Uh, given this uh, election year, now that President Trump now is facing, I think the most thing he cares is the election. Uh, it's the re-election, how to be re-elected in the White House, uh, rather than any other issues. Uh, because at the very, uh, this has been seen uh, very clearly from beginning up to now. At the beginning, when there's a virus, uh, it seems not that serious. He uh, have uh, you know uh, no concern. He said, let's keep going to campaign. Uh, it's nothing serious about this. It's just like a flu. So he even gave this uh, coronavirus another name called uh, just the Corolla flu. So it's just uh, no need to care. So he turned, uh, you know, the deaf ear to any of those suggestions and recommendations from those uh, medical experts. But nowadays, because all those virus issues, you cannot hide anymore. When the people got sick, they got, uh, you know, the, have to see the uh, doctor and be sent to hospital and even uh, died, uh, you know, uh, one, uh, more and more. So now he got a serious issue. But now he cannot just saying all, all those serious things is because of my ignorance at the beginning. So this is not his way. So he went through this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this uh, failure uh, totally to somewhere else. So where he can throw away uh, just to uh, pick up China. 
as a scapegoat. Uh, so this is also can maybe to meet those desire coming from those left uh, rightist people. Uh, those people, I think, they have the spaces there. Maybe they get uh, uh, through this kind of uh, uh, scapegoat pickup uh, to China, and maybe can uh, get more voters, uh, those tickets uh, from those people there. Uh, of, of course, as my American colleagues just mentioned, yeah, those people are not just the President Trump himself. He has been surrounded. Uh, we all know from those like uh, State Secretary Pompeo, so all those people are surrounded him. Uh, so, uh, of course, this is not uh, good news at all for China-U.S. relationships, uh, particularly uh, during the past, uh, you know, one year and a half, we have been facing those, uh, uh, you know, the China-U.S. trade talk, uh, very, uh, very hard talk. So it seems we reached the first phase uh, deal uh, among those uh, uh, coming from the 13 times more this negotiation, but now with this virus issue. So if we cannot like uh, handle this issue in a very cooperative way or just uh, uh, criticize each other and uh, trying to blame each other, uh, even saying uh, the virus is using those racial tone to describe it, yeah, maybe that we will fall into the trap. Uh, somebody saying it's called a decouple, a decouple, China, US. So being the first uh, biggest uh, economy and the second biggest economy, I think this decouple between China and the U.S. not only a disaster for China and the U.S. and it will be a disaster for the whole of the world. Uh, that could be very destructive. But I also want to take a minute to look at how media are reporting on these lockdowns in China and other parts of the world. I mean, in China, when Hubei province was locked down to slow the spread of the virus, many media questioned China's, quote, draconian move, bringing up human rights issues, personal freedoms, et cetera, and focusing on the panic and anger among Chinese citizens. But then, when Italy, Spain, and France enacted countrywide lockdowns, human rights weren't brought up. Articles focused on how residents are boosting morale there by singing songs on their balconies in Italy, for example. Why the difference, uh, Mario? This difference is, again, it's so top of my mind. Uh, I don't want to say I lose sleep over it, but I almost do. It's exactly what you just said, the same thing. And I, 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 wrote, I wrote the words, and I, I shared them with my wife, who's, again, a local Chinese. And I said, civic duty is not authoritarian, draconian, communist crackdown. It's just civic duty. And when... Your government says, and your local leaders, call it government, that's too, too general a word. When, when the leadership says of your country or of your neighborhood, it points out to you, hey, we have a big problem and we all need to cooperate together to overcome this problem. And that's what we did. By the way, it's going to be tough. It's going to be harsh. We don't have a choice. We're talking about people's lives at stake. Mm -hmm. This is to help you avoid getting, dying or unknowingly, because the virus, again, we know the story, right? The virus is asymptomatic for, for one to two weeks. You need to make sure you're not spreading it. This is life and death, and this is the preservation of society. This will this be... This is life and death. This is preservation of society. Yeah, this will That's be what it is. A, a time that will test our strength, our capacity to be kind and generous, to rise above our own self-interest, to see yeah. beyond ourselves and bring the best of who we are, because we, humanity as a whole, is in this together. Thank you very much, Mario Cavallo, CEO of yes. M Communication Group from Shenyang in northeastern China. Thank you so much for joining us. And also Professor Ho Wenping, Senior Research Thank Fellow you. at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, joining me from Beijing via Skype. And that's going to do it for this edition of The Point. As always, follow us on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Download the CGTN app to watch our show or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thank you for watching. You've got The Point.